So we're here today uh, for the Artist Make Change project. I'm Rachel and I'm joined here by Glenn, who's also on uh, the Artist Make Change project. And today we're going to be talking to Gabrielle and Zarina from The White Pew. Um, so I'm going to pass over to you guys just to introduce yourselves and tell so my name is Gabrielle Del Puente. I'm from and based in Liverpool. I'm 26. And Serena. I'm Serena Mohammed. I'm 26 and I'm from and based in London. And we run a website together called The White Cube, which for a long time has been a lot of art criticism, exhibition reviews, art thoughts in general. More recently, we've started to write about games and food, and we've also got a run, writer's grant that we do and a successful funding application library as a resource. Great, thank you. Um, and Glenn and I have uh, collected in lots of questions from different people who've been sending their questions to us by Twitter and Instagram and by email. Um, and we were asking people what they would like us to ask you. Uh, so, Glenn, do you want to start with the first question that we've got? Yeah, I can go with that. Uh, so our first question came in from uh, Benita Wallier. Uh, and Benita uh, asked on Twitter, uh, I want to know what made you brave enough to really call out establishments and people in your early days of activism. <laughs> it's because I'm Scouse. <laughs> I don't know about Serena. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Scouse, but I think I, for me, I was kind of when we started, we didn't really think that anyone was listening. So <laughs> we just kind of published this, not really thinking about an audience beyond the conversation we were having between the two of us. So we, it wasn't like a conscious decision, like, I'm going to fucking call this person out. Um, it, just, it was just kind of like, oh, no one's. It, it, no one's saying this. I mean, that was like a secondary concern. Um, I think we got like a vague thrill from saying something a little bit like, I don't know, contentious or controversial. But that even then was kind of not really, it wasn't like we were doing it in a shock jock kind of way. I think it, it never really made sense for us to be scared of it in the first place, I think. We, we were... I mean, we went to art school, we were art students at the time when we started, so we weren't like fully outside, but we never felt like we were truly inside the tent, you know, like we were kind of in between, caught on the tent flap. Yeah, and I think when, so we'd originally started the website just as exhibition reviews, and, you know, we've, we've never like gone out of our way to get readers, they've just, it's sort of just happened, and as that number has grown, and the visibility has grown, and also by nature of that, the power as well. Um, we started to feel a bit more of like a responsibility to those readers because if there is this, you know, issue with other publications that are like tiptoeing around an issue or um, just so tied to like the adverts that fill their pages or the people that they know and this kind of awkward socialite Face of the art world sometimes like if no one else is just going to say something and if also <laughs> those publications are held to libel laws <laughs> like slander and they're incorporated in a more yeah structural way like if they can't do it or they refuse to and they don't care enough and they're scared then we should because we're like cowboys and no one's gonna tell us off and the only person who like edits me is Zarina and I'm never gonna say don't don't say that I'm just gonna say maybe say it like this <laughs> um so we we felt that responsibility because we were uh, it what felt like the only people able to speak sometimes on certain issues because we didn't mind taking the risk like we whatever happened happened and we, no one was there to edit us yeah I think we're like, we're not very risk averse, I think. Is that the phrase? Risk averse? Yeah. Not sure. <laughs> but like, we've got this kind of, whether it's misplaced or not, we've got this quite like, like an impeachable attitude. Not of like, we're not accountable to anyone. Like, we can do what we like. We run this town. But kind of like, well, you can try and sue us. 
please do. Oops. We've got no one's no one's tried yet. No one's tried yet, but we have still got digital risk insurance that covers. We pay ten pounds a month, and it covers us <laughs> for up to I think quarter of a mil. And if anyone wants any more from us by suing us, please feel free. I've got a half-eaten packet of gum and two hundred pounds and a help to buy ISA. So you can have a go, but I'm not sure you're looking. <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna get. So <laughs> good luck to you. Um, I don't know. I think it's that thing, right? If you don't have much to begin with, you don't feel too bad about gambling it, right? Like we didn't really feel like we had much to lose. We weren't gonna. We weren't getting invited to the private views anyway. You know what I mean? Like so that social risk factor didn't really kind of clock. We it didn't. We didn't clock it. We've never been that interested in like social climbing or networking in that sense. So. And I, I think all of this is like underpinned by. If the art world is as bad as it is right now, why would we stay? Like, why would any of us stay? If if money is funneled upwards and it's all functioning because of volunteer labor, if the people in power are all these like white, cis, non-disabled, middle-class people, like how is any of that fun? Like, how does that influence the experience of going to a gallery? Um, how does it feel to be an art student trying to break into that? Why would you want to break into it? Why would we, I don't know, why would we be like blind cheerleaders to all of it instead of like real critics? Because it's so bad and yeah. I think as well, like the fact that we are independent still, like there, there have been moments in time where across our career, talking thinking about it as a career is bizarre as well, but like, <laughs> I think maybe like two years in, was it? We got an offer from, um, a London-based magazine, <laughs> or like a, a magazine based in many metropolitan cities across the world, but this was the London version of that magazine. Um, and the editor, like the arts editor, had kind of like just come on board, was trying a little bit of a different track with it, and he wanted to like have a chat with us and see if we wanted to write for them. And we were kind of like, not really, no. Like, it, it didn't make sense to us to trade in that independence in return for, like, whether it's the stability or, like, gravitas of, you know, I was about to say the name again, but, um, yeah, it didn't make sense to us to trade that in for, like, an established journal. 60 pounds for 300 words as well. Some buttons, like, buttons. honestly. Um, and there have been moments where we could have probably traded in any clout or social capital that we've accumulated to write for another journal or publication. But I think we value the independence that we've built up and it doesn't make sense to trade any of that for like the stability of writing for someone else. Um, unless it's on these very specific terms, like with the dazed column or, you know, guest publishing or commissions and stuff like we've I, I think it's important for us to retain an element of our independence and be able to say the things we want in our own space on our own terms so also it's, if it would be also like just back to the question it would be a very different story if it was just one of us i think it's yeah. the fact that we're together and we can egg each other on and like you know <laughs> like you're younger and you do something and your mum's like if if such and such told you to put your hand in the fire would you do it and if Zarina told me to, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> would you? I was about to ask. If I, told, if I was like, we're going to jump off this bridge, Cap, would you? jump. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> We are enablers, isn't it? Like, we've got this very yes and attitude to each other and what we do. Like, we're just like, yes and? Like, it's never, uh, like, no, I think that's ill-advised. Unless it's literally like, um, I don't know. Why have we ever said no to each other? <laughs> I don't know where And just quickly, um... Uh, was there uh, a sense of um, being out for the establishment at the start of that? Was there a dissatisfaction with the establishment and that's what you were trying, uh, and that was the target at the start? It, yes, but only in the sense that we were uh, very turned off by the idea of like who else got to write and like the writing scene. Um, you know, if you're like an art student and you you kind of come into this being excited that one day you might be able to be an artist in a studio, like exhibiting, and blah, 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 making things that you're really proud of. And then we were in, an, in, a, in school and the tutors would say to us, oh, you know, you should get a subscription to like Art Monthly and Art Review with your student loans. And I was like, okay, because that's me being well-behaved. And then 
you know you get that and it's just like Cartier adverts and like descriptions of exhibitions and then ends July 26th and I'm like what what values does this add to my life because I can't really see it um like that was in that sense that was the establishment that I felt like we were working against at the beginning but over the course of these years realizing that that exists within an ecosystem of so much more and when an artist you know it's not just the art in the exhibition but it's like the artist who made it and how did the curators decide to pick that artist right now and where is this gallery based and why are they choosing to do these exhibitions right now instead of something that people want to see like all of this other stuff around it became so much more a part of the conversation and so that we did really have to like stretch out our um fight as you as you might call it right thanks really great thank you um i was wondering as well i mean this kind of ties in with what you were just getting to there and this is a question from lena simich uh who was messaging us on instagram and she's saying uh, what keeps you awake at night like what bothers you <laughs> I've been thinking oh about God, this question. So funny. What keeps you awake? Honestly, for me, like, it's less like, like the crushing pressure of it all. And it's more like I'm kept awake by like this one moment um, two years ago where I showed a friend a picture of me with a pint of Kingfisher and I was wearing a top that had the Kingfisher logo. It's like a brand of beer that's really nice with Indian food like if you're unfamiliar get to know <laughs> and like I was wearing the Kingfisher logo holding a pint of a Kingfisher and my friends went oh yeah that's a really big pint and I was like no that's not the point and then he kind of moved on and I was like it's too late for me to be like did you see the t-shirt and it, it just kind of it was a non-issue and I cannot stop thinking about that so honestly super candidly that is actually what keeps me up at night Imran Peretta if you are listening I was showing you the picture of my t-shirt and I, just, I feel like it didn't get the acknowledgement that it deserved. Oh my god, you've gone mental. <laughs> I, like, things keep me up at night in a logistical sense because I can't stop playing video games. Um, Death Stranding at the moment, like, I'm, I'm going to bed at 3am because I'm addicted to playing it. Not, I don't even, don't even think I'm addicted, I'm just very involved with it. It's great. Um, in terms of, like, Zarina says the cru it's not the crushing pressure of everything but I do feel like there's so much to be done and we are like two people who are having have an office on whatsapp and like we've we're just now making like enough on patreon to pay ourselves two months ago I finally moved out because I was like this I can now afford rent like I think sometimes the thing that keeps me up is the fact that we've got quite an inflated image of like who we are and what we are capable of and at the end of the day we can only do so much and I wish that there were like more people fighting um, and writing and pushing things to flatten out the pressure a little bit because I think people you know our, our inbox on Instagram and Twitter are like they move so incredibly quickly and we miss so much and we get message requests every day from people who are in really difficult situations sometimes like in terms of like employment issues with galleries or and a brand has ripped off their design or all these different things that they think well the white people can help me and the fact that we can't because we can only do so much drives me mental and, and that's why like sometimes you know we, we've been speaking recently about like is there a way that we could do this full time because then we could like cater to people and be in service of our audience a little bit better but like is that what the white cube is or is it the writing that we do and is it a bit of both and all these things are like what I'm trying to reconcile with. Part of me wonders like if it is I don't I don't think we as two people have the resources to even <laughs> tackle that like you know what I mean like I, I think things like that I'm like maybe there should be a news site <laughs> there should be like an actual oh, oh I was about to say an actual art newspaper that night, but there is, isn't it? 
Well, you know what I mean? Like maybe the news, like in terms of like current affairs and like the way these things get processed, if there was more investigative journalism in the arts is what I probably mean. Like millions and millions of Morgan Queens. Yeah. 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 That's like, what, that's what we want. <laughs> yeah. And I think like I've literally just, I finished therapy. I've been like my therapist said, Daniel said, good job you're good you're cured and like one of the things that we like <laughs> that like he I think spent so long trying to like drill into my noggin was that I need to have an evening and I need to turn off and like it's fine if there's more stuff to do because I'm not going to fucking fix the art world in one day am I uh, like I just gotta I've gotta we have got to do what we can within the nine to five a reasonable working day and then we are allowed to have an evening like we can't bear the weight of the entire art world ills on our shoulders it's it, not fair to it is yeah it is hard because when your job is on the internet in front of everybody and you've mm. said to everyone like we're always open for conversation like it doesn't actually ever switch off and yeah like me and Zarina are in this very we got into a habit very quickly of when we sit down at a table we turn our phone face down so that we can't see it because then we can eat or and that is I like I do that all day every day and like when I'm ready I can like check on but kind of interesting with the internet because when you go on it other people are about to demand some something of you all day every day and when when that's on like a mega scale like it is for us you can get really like wow because you 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 want to do your job well instead of like you know spread out thin and just like oh this is scatty um it's very it's a lot to deal with yeah, definitely. And I think that thing as well, like you're saying, it's easy for people to forget that you're two people who are doing this, like at the moment, doing it, it as part time alongside other stuff. <laughs> and that sense of like, yeah, how, how resourced is any, you know, set of individuals or collective or a, you know, small organisation to actually be able to like respond to that mass like request you know like people are having a hard time a lot of the time and so yeah where are those kind of structures like one of the things that Glenn and I have been uh, asking people as well is about stuff like unions like trade unions or organizations and things like that and maybe that maybe it kind of alludes to a space for uh, yeah more more kind of people to join up in that way I mean and part of me is kind of like, there's only so much a union can do, because I understand that. There's only so much an, a union can do, though. They have to kind of have some kind of bargaining power within the institution. There has to be that density there. Like, um, you know, Artists Union in England exist and have done so for years now. And they kind of, how much power do they have to bargain with the government for like an increase in the rescue emergency packaging and whatever? The <laughs> emergency rescue package and like you know Tate United doing an incredible job like organizing Tate employees to like go on strike they, they, that's like a legally cleared strike that exists and like PCFs were instrumental in securing that emergency funding it wasn't like the Tate that it wasn't Maria Balshaw that like swung that it was PCFs and the unions and like there's only so much that they can physically do like Thatcher era laws decimated the power of the unions like um I think it requires some level of compliance from the top down right Boris Johnson needs to pull his finger out nice Glenn do you have another question for us sorry I was just uh, unmuting myself and trying to get to grips with the technology um uh, yeah, waiting for Boris Johnson to sort himself out. Might take That'd be a while. Um, also, I did get a bit stuck on on you fixing the art world, and maybe we can come back to how that's going to happen because that seems like a, a job in itself too. Um, but uh, something you said earlier on um, about how you work together and how you um, sort of egg each other on uh, was uh, was a nice insight in how. Uh, in how the relationship works between you and uh, we got a, um, a question in from um, painting text uh, at painting text off twitter um, uh, which asks which arts related topic or artist do you have the greatest difference of opinion on 
That's a really good question. I don't know. I had one argument, right? Like one argument in five years. And I mean, that was five years of the four, four and a bit years of the white pube and the years that we knew each other before then in, in art school. And that was whether or not you should use conditioner. <laughs> just like nothing to do with art whatsoever. Serena was like adamant. She was like, it's as important as toothpaste. And I was like, it's not. I think it is. I think honestly. My hair is still on my head. Do you know what? And, and that is a modern day miracle. I have no idea what's <laughs> keeping it on there other than sheer force of will. Like, <laughs> you need conditioner, please. If you use shampoo, use conditioner. We're not in olden times. We're not cavemen. Don't you know, Gabrielle? <laughs> but at the same time, after that argument, I did apologise the next day. I was like, do you know what? It's your body and these are your opinions. And I believe in you being a survivalist. Like, we're both survivalists in different ways, I think. Like, uh, but like, we, when it comes to our opinions on the arts, I, like, we don't overlap fully. Like, there are some things... Like we've walked into exhibitions and Gab said, I fucking hate this. And I've been like, I love it. It's the best thing I've seen all year. Like, probably like not. Obviously, as... naturally. That's, that's the <laughs> truth. Yeah. But I think, I don't know, for the past five years of working together in such close proximity to each other, like, we've been best mates and, like, art sisters and friends underneath it all. I think, like, we respect each other, like, more than we respect anyone else. So, like, it's kind of, I don't know. I think I... I don't care that um, Gab's got different opinions about like collage. I think I respect the validity of her love for collage. If you do indeed love collage, <laughs> I do wish we had like a more juicy answer for that that yeah. question. But it's it's just we're all good. <laughs> yeah, it was just the conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> I think it gives us a great insight though into like the way that you work together and that that starts from friendship or that that starts from knowing each other and getting on with each other. Um, and that kind of leads into a great question that we've got from Rebecca Davies, who was emailing us. And um, her question was, how important is it to you, how important to you is humour and laughing in and at this shit? Can we be funny and have criticality? Oh, yes, you can. But it will, um, you know, every so often cause murder. For example, people might know that you're joking, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> For example, at the end of the day, all this is is like weird shit in rooms and we go and look at it or listen or like whatever. We have an encounter. That's what we decided to do that day. We could have done millions of other things, but we decided to go and look at the stuff in the room. I think that's strange. <laughs> like at the end of the day. I think that's like, very weird. There aren't any other animals that like make <laughs> art, are there? Like you don't see dolphins all puffing along to like a specific cave in the ocean to like look at nicely arranged shells. It's a very bizarre thing we do. And the fact that no one treats it as bizarre is bizarre. And yeah, like you've got to deal with it with humor. I think that's part of it. But like, you know, if your reaction to an exhibition or to the system is like wow this this is ridiculous this is just beyond me at this point I can only laugh like or you know you have a you're at a performance for example in Goldsmith's degree show <laughs> and you feel uncomfortable you don't you know it's like what what do I do with myself in this situation when I've got a like I don't like this I feel like oh I feel weird because of the weirdness of it all um you know, sometimes people will take that very badly because for them, you know, it means something else. It's difficult sometimes to be an audience member and not see the same meaning that they do. It's difficult to be on anyone else's level all the time. It's never going to work. There are always going to be people who don't quite feel the same way. And I think that's fine. I think we should, we should all relax a little bit about I think artists should um, pr like predict that a little bit more, that not everyone is going to have the same seriousness around the thing that they make, if that's what it's for. Um, I think we'd all be a, a bit better off for that. I think as well, like part of our specific brand of criticality is like a scepticism about the, the point of it all. Like, um, 
the idea that art is this rarefied, sanctified thing that we've got to treat with like some kind of special status of protection, like it's some great intellectual pursuit rather than a bizarre thing that humans do. Like the, the idea, I think that's very, not completely specific to us, but like it's a part of the way we want to go about approaching these things. And the idea that like even gallery directors are above <laughs> Like, a little bit of ridicule is fine. <laughs> like, some people are weird in the art world. Like, it's, and, and I think pointing out the ways in which they're weird is important because a lot of gal gallery directors are these bizarre middle class people that have these like, bizarre middle class mannerisms. And I think that's deeply funny. And they, they love, you know, art, gallery, gift shop, jewelry. And yeah. we, should, we should think about that. And they love to go on there. Haircuts, weren't they? And bad. long weird shaped clothes and they make six figure giant massive amounts of money while everyone else doesn't <laughs> so they can afford to dress weirdly knowing that as soon as they go down tesco they're gonna stick out like a sore thumb and they choose to wear bad trainers on purpose knowing that those bad trainers are expensive and i just think that's all funny <laughs> it's all funny yeah yeah really good and there's something in there about the um almost a pomposity around the um, around the subject of art um, and uh, how you know how powerful it is or where the powers are uh, if there are any um, and we got a question in um, about I, I guess around this from kiss by electrons on Twitter uh, at electron kiss um, is only good art able to make change uh, and follow up um, what is good Hashtag art. And I don't know whether the hashtag there is by accident. Um, but yeah. I, quite, I quite like I quite like it. So the follow-up is what is good hashtag art? Okay. This is this is my position. That's a bad question. <laughs> my position is like uh, last year, was it when we went to Kochi? Last year? Yeah. Early last year. We went to Kochi Biennale last year in India in South India um, and we went to a workshop by an artist called Thomas Hershorn and it was it was described as like a critical workshop and we were like Ooh, we, we do we do criticism <laughs> so we kind of like went along to see what it was about and um, about six or seven artists who were local had signed up and I think he was doing these like every day for 30 days or something wild like that. And he sat everyone around the circle and he was within the circle as well. But because we weren't artists who brought something along to the crit, he asked us to sit on a circle outside the, cir the main one. So that was like, ooh, okay. So we were just observing. And he gave a preface to all of it to, just to say that for him, you know he didn't really think there was like good or bad art he thought that what there was was energy and quality and quality is the thing that is given to art by like museums and curators and the the canon and the market but energy is something like between you and the art itself and like if you go to a museum and you know that, you know, there's a giant Rothko and you know, it has quality because it's important and it's worth a lot of money and like people write about it and stuff like that. But you stand in front of it and you don't feel anything. Then for you, that doesn't really have any energy, but you might see something that like your cousin drew you little cousin on something. And for you, it's got so much energy because of what it means, what it looks like, but it doesn't have any quality because it's not being validated. And I think like it's such a more straightforward way of approaching all of this that like it is, comp it, I think it's what me and Zarina were already doing, but without those terms. Um, and this is all to say that like in the crit, he then asked people one by one to share a piece of art that they'd made. And there was a film, there was like a watercolor of a fish, I believe. Um, you put it in the center of the circle and then everyone would go around one by one and say whether it had energy for them or not. So it was like, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. And then they would go back around the circle and explain why. 
So it's kind of an interesting moment for people to confront their own like subjectivity, but also to try and work it out for themselves. Because I think it is quite difficult to say, I think I like this because, and work out like what your own compass points are for good and bad. So it was this whole like experience that we had just on the outside looking in and I feel like whether or not quote good quality art can make change or not is just it's just a bad question because it just depends whether it has an effect on you personally like that's it's just about the encounter it's about what you know what you find value in that's a really good answer yeah <laughs> <laughs> it really is and it's something that really shines through in the way that you guys approach writing as well it's something that as a reader of things that you write uh it it's bringing me back into that like subjective zone so rather than having to only think about art in those terms of quality or what's important or what's hot right now uh yeah bringing it bringing it back to what that energy is it's a really nice way of phrasing it. Thanks. <laughs> Just good. Um, I've got the next question, I think. Which is, <coughs> Just do that little cough. Um, which is from Rebecca Davies. Again, she's been giving us lots of questions by email. Uh, this one's quite a nice one. So it's got a number of parts. Protest or discussion? What's your favorite modus operandi for making change? And have you got any tips for how best to quench or channel rage when you're at the table with the enemy? <laughs> right, that's a good question. Cause I, I think like, right. <laughs> like there, there is like a generation of, of person, right? Like Gen X, they, my, my dad's Gen X. He loves saying, things like yeah but what about a reasonable discussion and like but why don't your generation take things like this to the you know the polling station and you can vote these things into you know you can vote the police away and it's like no um i don't know if you know how these institutions work these institutions are kind of built to absorb the critique that hits them in like at a certain point right critique that is leveled against an institution, it will adapt to accommodate that critique rather than change the fundamental structure or basis of itself, right? Like, so <laughs> discussion can only do so much because, you know, these directors, these people in power, they will nod and they will say that we're really here to listen to your concerns. Like Maria Balshaw herself wrote an article, I think for the art newspaper, uh, called Art in Sensitive Times, which was like, this great treatise on <laughs> the liberal the arts, liberal values, right? It it's it positioned art and the institution that that hosts this art as um, a forum for discussion. This vessel that can contain all these conflicting opinions, and it's good to just have that conversation, right? And like you know, the institution itself can be neutral in the face of these discussions, and we've got a handle these sensitive times like with sensitivity and it was it was just kind of like completely devoid of any acknowledgement or understanding of the fact that these sensitive times are sensitive for particular people who have been historically marginalized and who you know that sensitivity is literally a matter of life or death for so it, it kind of to me i think discussion doesn't make much particular sense when it comes to conversations about like um anti-racism within institutions because time and time again just the existence of you know 40 50 years of diversity policy alone tells us that discussion is completely pointless the diversity policy that's in place at the moment is in fact geared <laughs> to like completely level out any attempt at like equity for people of color within the institution like that it, it, these things are not engineered in a way that makes equity possible they are, are geared to like segregate and stuff difference into these specific categories that can be compartmentalized and redeployed when useful so i think in situations like that protest is probably the most useful thing out of the two of those things but i think protest must involve some kind of like um organized action and we've got to organize amongst ourselves to create new structures with that are inherently more equitable that are more horizontal we've got to demand like 
<laughs> ownership on our own terms in the same which i think is part of why we value the white pubes independence so much because we can organize pretty horizontally here between the two of us <laughs> like um and we, we can work you know as best as we can to distribute the resources we get in and like throw things at people and be like right as prize you get 500 pounds you get this and we can be the institution we want to see in the world <laughs> god that's fucking pretentious but like it kind of it, it it's protest with a purpose it's more than just shouting at the table right like you've got to you've got to kind of put your money where your mouth is and and do the work in whatever way you can um in terms of quenching quelling your anger was it what was the second question and uh, the question that part was have you got any tips for how best to quench or channel rage when at the table with the enemy um i've got very poor anger management <laughs> i've got an aries moon like i just i can't i can't my like my moon is in aries i can't i'm an angry person um i it's rare that we find ourselves in the room with with the enemy in that sense like we, we spend a lot of time telling people to fuck off on, on the internet so i don't think or, or we ask people for meetings and they say no yeah that's the other thing like you know certain biennial directors like dodging or being like oh no no oh, it's like come on let's just meet i'm about to publish like six thousand words about you <laughs> come on do you want do you want the spoiler <laughs> Um, I'll read it to you in person. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think like just always try and I, I don't know preparing. If you know that you are about to like go into that kind of conversation, like preparing points beforehand so that when you go in there, you don't feel like you're you know you're not the one in control of the conversation. I think that's important. Make because also then you won't leave hopefully with that feeling of like oh, I should have said this. I should have said this, that you said everything you need to say. And also knowing that like there and then, um, you know, you're not going to probably get what you want, but holding people to account and like returning to them and going public with things if you need to, getting in touch with the white pew, like all these different things. Mm. Um, knowing that, you know, this might have to be a long fight is I think, yeah, that would be helpful. Brilliant. Thanks, both of you, for that. It was uh, fascinating. Um, just uh, to change tack slightly, um, I guess, and, and move backwards a little bit. Um, uh, I mean, it's pretty clear that, uh, that you are where you are at the moment through activity and, and doing things and experiencing it and responding to those things. But it, uh, in a sense of how, how you got there, we've had a question in from Jess Longmore. Uh, on Instagram, and um, and uh, she's talking about um, art students, and uh, she wanted to know what the most valuable thing you have learned since leaving university that you'd wish you'd learned at university. And I guess you know, at a time when the students are just uh, going back right now, in probably the most crazy times to be a student of any in any discipline, um, um, this, uh, uh, there's some real interest here. So. Hmm. I think oh, ours is, I, I, was, I don't know what yours is going to be, but for me, like, especially on an art course, knowing that, or like looking back now, I realised that it wasn't so much about like, this is how, this is how art is made. <laughs> it was more a lesson in ways of thinking and having conversations and yeah, criticism and um planning and like project management and all these other things around the actual artwork itself that i now use like not i don't really use i don't make art anymore but so much of what i do now couldn't have happened without the art course and for me i felt towards the end of it that i was on the wrong course but because i was so interested in writing when actually that wasn't an issue at the end of it because it's all kind of come together so well. So I feel like if I, if I personally could go back and tell myself something, it was like to realize what else the art course is doing beyond art making. What would yours be, Zarina? Um, 
I think mine would be <laughs> uh, like I feel like I was just saying this, but it was on our call earlier. But um, I think that bit, right? Like they'd get artists, like practicing artists, in every Monday to kind of talk about their careers and like their their practices and stuff. And the thing that they always managed to miss out was the bit in between, kind of getting a foothold in the industry and like how they got there from when they graduated. And I think that was like the biggest question mark for us um, at the time. We were like, we'd spend hours kind of anxiously thinking, <laughs> discussing like what existed outside of art school. Like what do we do once we've graduated when this institution has just like flung us out into the big wide world? Like how do we go about being an artist? How do we, like how are you meant to afford uh, the rent for a studio on top of like your your house or flat or whatever in London like how are you meant to do that like do you have a part-time job because I don't think a part-time job can cover that like both those things like how logistically does it work and I still don't actually have the answer for that I have no idea how people do it I have no idea how artists make it <laughs> I would still like to know but um, I think it's kind of become a little bit clearer that that becomes more impossible with without generational wealth or without like external independent income um, like in London at least you've got to probably move outside the capital yeah there's so much there's so so much that we learned about all of that even just the year after we fun after we graduated you know the we realized then that the people who get exhibitions are the ones who've made themselves or have been made visible like they, they've made themselves visible or they've been written about or whatever it is and then they're the people who are on the curator's minds and because they're fashionable or trendy or whatever it is or they're friends with them and then they're the ones that will get exhibitions and then because they've had that exhibition someone else will see it and it just it's it's so social and I know everyone like we joke about this happening or well, not joke about it but it's just like a saying for every industry isn't it that it's who you know it just really is like, if, in, in, I don't agree with it in the slightest, but I, at the same time, like, I don't see it any other way because I think curators are so lazy about trying to find new people and doing things. And people, you know, who don't want to get Instagram and don't want to make up their own website. Like, there are other artists who come from what I think might be the better tradition of, like, making stuff in a studio, making stuff at home or in a studio and then thinking that, it's the curator's job to do the rest of it, to get funding, to organize publicity. Like it's, it's not their job. Their job is to make art. And I think it's unfair that artists are expected to do everything themselves now. And that is an issue that I think it's not on art schools necessarily to, to sort out, but it's, they should teach it. They should make all this clear because then people can start to think of ways around it and can go into this like knowing like this is like a big ask like, if, if so much of it is predicated on sociability and uh, it's just I think it's ridiculous but I, I, I think there should be better education around it. I think as well maybe like the way institutions actually run is pretty opaque from the outside I think and part of me says that in like the vaguest way possible like you know uh, <laughs> how does an event at I don't know I keep talking about the tape wow but like you know how does the tape like get produced like a part of me wants to know more about like like the specificity of like public program and like all these other things and I think part they do kind of teach you that at art school but um the bureaucratic element gets a bit lost and I think things like that are pretty important because the bureaucracy of the institution is like like 80% of your job when you leave it right like 80% of our time is taken up emailing people very politely and you know professionally -ish. Mm -hmm. and that I wasn't aware of that and maybe it was just naivety on my part I feel like I could spend the rest of my adult life thinking about gorgeous intelligent things but you know I don't know <laughs> I feel like that should probably be a part of it and it kind of was but maybe more so mm -hmm. And I guess like thinking about that idea of um, the structures in which art is made and shown, things like that as well. Um, if you were starting things from scratch yourselves, 
and you were going to start a kind of ideal space for that to happen um what would be the things that you'd be looking to instill or to start and maybe also um gabrielle this kind of links across to to your own experiences as well but yeah a question for both to be first in that sense of how would you start your own ideal kind of art space <laughs> well we i don't know years and years ago we were like what what is what are we doing like is our end goal that we're going to get a gallery like if i'm in liverpool where would it do you have like a white puke gallery like where would it be <laughs> and uh, fate would have it that in 2018 i got an email from the Invisible Women Factory in Liverpool, which is like essentially a, a giant nightclub <laughs> with a smaller bar and produces their own artistic kind of technological, creative technology stuff, uh, lights, sound, all that stuff. Um, and they had a workshop space that was empty and they wanted to make it into an art space because the Roport area of Liverpool city centre is like so incredibly dead now in terms of culture. It used to have so much like Walton Home Arts space, uh, cream, so mellow, mellow, all this famous kind of independent art and music ventures. And it is all now ugly flats and like an only fools and horses bar. <laughs> just all this shit so they were wanting to turn the workshop space in the city center into an art space and had gotten in touch with open eye gallery to say do you think anyone would be interested and they said to get in touch with the white cube and i saw the email and was just like oh my god um because it had felt like for years and years we'd been writing about all the issues that we'd seen and not being able to find solutions for anything that we could be like, we could get behind. Um, if there were like little things, it was always a part of an institution that we hated. <laughs> we were like always felt so torn about it. And then suddenly someone was saying to me, well, do you want this space? And what do you want to do with it? And if I, I was like, oh, the pure stars aligned. So I was able to start Output Gallery and try and implement everything that I'd learned from writing with, with Zarina um, between just the exhibition experience, but also like how things are run and how things, I don't know, just exist in cities and not as like magic boxes of galleries that don't ever look outside themselves. Uh, so, so much of it went into the space, for example, output only works with people from or based in Merseyside because I mean, I don't even really need to go into it, but everyone in Liverpool, it, it's like everyone in Liverpool who makes art is seen as just a bit crap, like plebs to the institutions. Like they're just, but if you're from Manchester, you're suddenly exotic. Like I don't get it. And no, none of us get it. So it felt like the first step. The second thing was obviously trying to just do a program that was like representational and not just the same few people. Uh, then I, because the gallery was called Output, I did something called Input, where I said, if you want to get paid to exhibit, can you come and show me what you do? And we can, we can have a chat. Or you can send me an email or whatever it is. And there was like a queue out the door for the weekend of people with portfolios, people who were outside of my filter bubble. Um, also just audience who were like, I really want to see some photography or I'm really into this type of film like it would be amazing if you could find some artists to work in that way because I'd love to see it um other artists and other studios in the city who said you know I'm part of this group but we don't have any crypts or people who work from home and say I would love to have a social space because I just don't see anyone and when I do see people it's like my family and they just think the art that I make is good but that's all I ever hear. I just want to know what else to do next or like if it's good. Um, so output used input to shape itself just as much as like the white pube experience did as well. So it, I was able then to meet millions of artists who are all local. Um, 
you put them into like the shape of a program, go to the Arts Council to bid for funding, got the funding, also implemented art socials, group crits, continuous input events so that people always felt like they could come and ask to be on the next one. Um, you know, make the funding application visible, transparent, did funding workshops so that people could read it. Like all, just all this stuff and just trying to make a space where like it didn't feel, it didn't feel like you had nothing to do with it. Because of the input events, I get this sense that people feel like they've had a hand in what has happened with the space. So it is more attached to the local art scene. And I'm quite open that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still the person making decisions, but I'm just trying to do it in like a balanced way and trying to get like a little bit of photography, a little bit of sculpture. <laughs> I'm just going with what's available. Like the last input, people wanted loads of sound art. So that is what is on the 2020 program, which is just obviously being like stalled because of coronavirus. But there's loads of sound art that people will get to enjoy in like two music residencies, which I never thought I'd like be in control of, but that's what the people want. And I think it's kind of funny, like one thing that I've learned from the white people as well is like not to confuse quality and taste so just because I don't necessarily like something doesn't mean it's bad like other people are gonna find energy in it to use the terms that I was talking about before um you know it's it's well produced it's whatever it is and to include that as well so not everything I said it sounds bad to say that but not everything on it is like stuff I would run to see but it's stuff that people really appreciate so just a mix of all that and like making sure everyone's paid and I get to be paid from it and it's such a like, little tiny weird space but like it functions quite well um and none of that would exist without these politics of the white people I feel like I've been able to manifest everything in one space I don't think it's perfect by any means <laughs> um but I'm very proud of everything I've done with it <laughs> 10 minute rant I'll put that is good I, I'm like you know what it it's one of those things where I'm like, I wish there could be, maybe not like an exact out. Like, I don't know if you can franchise the specific oh, so this model is, out. <laughs> this is the plan. <laughs> I've been try like I tried to get funding for it last year from some woman died in Liverpool and like left loads of money, and she said that the arts people could bid for it, and obviously none of it went to me. It all went to like the blue coat and all these different people, obviously. But I sent an application to be like, look, output as a, as a model is great. It's, it's served its art team really well. People who had never had an exhibition before have had an exhibition output and then the institutions have seen them and then gotten in touch with them. Or, you know, I've been able to nominate a photographer who showed with us for a prize and then she's shown across Europe. It just like works. Like it's, it's like a little incubator, yeah. but it's also a really mix of like, Mark Leckie was exhibited, Shyla Behrman, the Sing Twins next month, like trying to raise Kate Cooper, raise the profile of Liverpool artists and put those big names with people who no one knows. Just so it's like, just a mix. Um, and I also don't think like, yeah, I, I know some of those people because of the conversations we've had with Dwight Pugh. So it's, it's all kind of feeds into each other. Um, uh, yeah, so I, had bid to try and franchise output. <laughs> so I could say like, if there was an output in Middlesbrough that only worked with people from or based in Middlesbrough. And then what if also, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna just give this idea and whoever's listening might be like a rich person and they can like get in touch with me. If there was like output and input and it was like a space with two split down the middle. So the output would be the local side and the input could be people who've shown in the other outputs on tour. So it would just be like this big cycle. Mm -hmm. And then it would mean that the artist would get to tour and they would get extra fees. I just think it would be great. I feel like it would just solve all the world's issues. Um, Honestly, no, I like it, it does like such a specific job to cater to Liverpool's arts ecology. Like it, it plugs every single gap, I think, that exists in that 
<laughs> every major gap that exists in like Liverpool's arts ecology and like in such a way that like the bigger institutions see what you're doing and then <laughs> do the same thing in a less helpful way oh, like yeah. they've, the way they've copied has driven me mad like, it, it proves like, it proves as well that like you're doing the right thing I think like regardless of them and their unethical working practices rather than partnering with you as they would with you know yeah. a reputable London gallery like they'd in, partner in, with them but. In terms of like the question though, it, of like if it would be like a perfect space and like what would you put into it? It would be so much of like the output stuff, but it wouldn't just be me. Like we can, I'm just kind of funding to pay. I get paid three days a week, which I, that's a thing of the past now because of coronavirus. Like it's not three. It's like one and one and a half days, I think. Um, the like it wouldn't be just it wouldn't just be me because I don't think that's fair it would be maybe I would go and set it up and then give it to other people or um it would be like a rolling thing so people could only ever be on it for one bid or something but do you know what I mean like it, I think it would be important to keep it changing um and yeah if there was like a franchise like all those places could be in conversation with each other and I think just like there's so much beauty in running something that you don't have to pass, you have to run ideas past other people. So like with the white pube, we just do things that we want. Like I set the funding library up without telling Zarina about it. I was like, it's up, <laughs> bye. Um, and with output, like you can test new ideas. Like starting with, I started with the gallery uh, podcast so that I could interview the artist, but like just did it. It's like all this, all this stuff. Like I, I don't think, um galleries innovate as much as they should um and we all say that we're in the arts and we're all like creative people but no one's ever coming up with new ideas and i don't understand that like i think places should be a lot more interesting than they are um, and yeah. so that's my challenge i think a lot of that is to do with like corporate the corporatization of gallery structures like they've all got this specific one way of doing things which is how like professionalism and best practice tell them that that's how they should work and it's so rigid and it requires like you act in this very specific manner that like caters to a very specific type of person and so in my mind working on that way like that that is small and like maybe not local but like deals with the local in a way that's sincere in like uh, as like a base standard that feels like a really good starting point for me as well like I think the way that you went with output like completely makes sense as coherent with our politic and like what we write about and um for me I feel like I'd be really bad as a curator or a gallery manager I don't think I have what it takes that's it I, I just call myself the gallery manager I feel like it's it's encapsulating <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's a good it's an it's, you still curate things but like it's a completely different approach to like the rca model of curation or you know yeah however you want to phrase it but um like i don't think i've got what i haven't got what it takes to be a curator <laughs> i'd be really bad at that um but i think i have written quite a lot about i guess structures and ideas for like addressing specific imbalances and problems within the art world like I, a lot of the art thoughts are like around that like ideas for a new art world and I literally hate the art world which are two different texts somehow with really similar names but um yeah I think there are a lot of, there's no like one really good perfect structure or like institutional model that I, I'd be willing to say I'm gonna hedge my bets on that because mm -hmm. I don't think I'm not sure if an output would work in London. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't yeah. think we need any of that like London wide locality. We've got enough of that. I think maybe <laughs> the focus is on like locality within like super specific underserved communities. And like that's a different conversation entirely. So like I don't know. It's all relative. This is a really bad answer in comparison to your really good ones. So just <laughs> skip over me. <laughs> Thanks, Bo. Yeah. I think it's important, Zarina, as well, what you're talking about there. I think that thing of like remembering when things translate and when they don't translate is is really, you know, it's not always as easy as like, we'll take this and put it here. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Glenn, do you think we're coming to our last question time? We're getting there, aren't we? Uh, it's been, uh, this hour's skipped by. Um, and 
you know, there's there's been so much um, real insight into what you've both been saying. Um, yeah, it's been really brilliant. We we have one uh, final question, which is the same for each of our interviews, uh, and just as a, a as a, a, a tailing piece, uh, and it, it's about um, our project and um, the ability of arts and artists to make change. Uh, and uh, I should just ask the question. So. What would your words of advice be for artists and arts workers who are seeking to make change? Shall I get the tumbleweed out? No, no, no. It's a really difficult question. <laughs> it's... Uh, advice to artists and art. Mm. I think... Um, I think like for, I, I can speak locally like what we found really useful is just getting in a room with each other and actually having conversations and doing what I've just been talking about of like trying to come up with new things and not just being like oh isn't it bad like I honestly don't think people just sit down with like a pen and paper enough and come up with something new and you know like if, I don't know in like a school approach like a year of school student like sit down and try and come up with 20 ways that this can work you've got an hour like that type of exercise of just like pushing for for bringing creativity back into all of this um i don't think that happens enough uh i think artists again if you're all in a room together you get to know each other and you can organize and not necessarily have to like formally wait or rely on union representation but like you exist together and you can organize things together and you can boycott things together and you can protest things and spread information and do all of this stuff if you've got the numbers um i don't i i know the world is pushing us all to see ourselves as like individuals but again we can't really get that much stuff done unless you're like a mega influencer um with a billion followers and even then probably not so I think that working on a local scale and trying to team up is is what I think is most effective. Because ultimately, also, just to say it again, it shouldn't really be on artists. It should be on the curators and they need to pull the finger out. Yeah. Um, I don't know, my advice, yeah, that. I think also, um, maybe this is super London specific as well, but I think, well, I think maybe in London that there's less a problem of getting together. Like we all kind of vaguely know what the problem is and we spend a lot of time complaining about it together and thinking about ways in which it could be different. I think the problem then comes with like manifesting <laughs> or like actually doing the things that we talk about. I think so many, of the best made plans are inhibited by the like the financial logistics of things and um i think people that work in institutions often forget the agency that they have to work within these spaces like um there's there's so much that you can do just from your position within an institution like with the clout institutionally <laughs> like in like in that specific language and vocabulary to help the people around you or like you know the people that perhaps are less stable and um like whether it's just like you've got like a spare meeting room that like an art like a group of artists could probably do something with like just getting together as like a peer forum um whether it's like putting together like all the leftovers from your budget and like commissioning tiny little events for that peer forum or like, you know, working in ways that is a little bit outside of the institution's comfortability realm, but like that you won't necessarily get penalized for. I understand that things like that require a level of like risk on your behalf, but um, there are ways to swing it as an individual. I think people that work in institutions, yeah need to pull their fingers out a little bit more in the exact way that Gab said because often these problems can't really be solved by artists who are like yeah kind of we're not individuals out in the wild wild west but in a way artists do kind of 
have these individual practices and like have to kind of function as you know individuals in institutional spaces i think they don't have the agency to make the change that say curators do and there's like there's like a degree of care i think that's required from people um is often missing i don't know if that's like specific advice for artists but for art workers in particular yeah i think it's really uh, important to understand um the uh the element of the institution you know uh, to know what it is and what you know what power it has um as you're um trying to work in uh, within the ecology so i think that is super important yeah. yeah, I think as well, there's like a massive, um, sorry, last minute addition, <laughs> there's a bit of a disparity, right, between like the pay that office staff, like curatorial staff in offices get and like front of house staff and like there's this assumption that somehow because the work is more specialised or like it's done at a desk rather than standing up that it's, it requires a high rate of pay. I think there's a lot that curatorial staff could be doing to stand in solidarity with front of house staff that are on the arse end of like these cuts and redundancies and the lack of government funding they're being kind of pushed out on shit creek in some sense so and also especially in galleries and maybe maybe galleries more so than museums or both like public facing staff are coming into contact with a very stressed public like many of whom are, you know, unable to access mental health services or like home support and are coming into the, into galleries because they're, they're free warm spaces and they know that they can have a conversation with someone and like people I know who work in galleries, like are, you know, that's a part of like their job description to, to socialize with these people who can, you know, sometimes be really upset or once in a while be dangerous and like that they're not they're not compensated for any of that or often trained or looked after for, for doing that and I think it's you know why why do the people upstairs who get to hide in their office and like listen to music and write funding applications get more money for that I don't know yeah I think that's uh, that's really uh, fascinating in a recent discussion we had with a, a group of Italian artists uh, looking to um, set up a, an artist union in Italy they they asked us why artists make change wasn't art workers make change and uh, yeah. I think we're really sympathetic to that and, and maybe as this project progresses then um, uh, that's an element that really ought to come to the fore. Yes. I'm going to pass over to Rachel to round up. Definitely. Uh, well I think that's I think there's been like so many really like juicy points that have come out of today. I'm really looking forward to watching this again. Um, and to sharing it with everyone online. So yeah, thank you both so much for making time today and we really appreciate it and for sharing your insights and your, your knowledge. Thanks thank very much. much. Thanks for asking us. <laughs>